I'm really Thanks everyone for coming for the last event of the day. Uh, as Trish said, the topic of our discussion is the digital evolution of the lab. Where are we now? So my name is Julia Caro. I'm a managing editor at Genome Web in New York. And with me here are our six panelists who I will introduce in a minute. Um, just a quick word about the format of this. So we have a number of prepared questions that we will start off with to get the discussion going. And then a little later on, we will open it up to your questions. So let me start. So on my left is Eric Banks. He is the senior director of the data sciences platform, as well as a computational biologist at the Broad Institute, which he joined in 2009. At the Broad, he leads a team of computational biologists and software engineers that implements novel computational methods, engineers and operates large-scale production pip pipelines, and develops innovative infrastructure. Eric holds undergraduate and master's degrees in engineering from MIT and a PhD in computa computational biology from Princeton University. Eric. Next to him is Chris Henry, who you have probably already heard earlier this morning. He is director of platform technology at Epic Sciences. He has extensive experience with data-enabled laboratory technology and business solutions including developing an automated results and reporting system for pathology labs and designing and implementing Epic Science's first clinical laboratory system. Previously, he was leader of the Laboratory Informa Information System Center of Excellence at Clarient, and before that, IS Director for Anatomic Pathology at US Labs. Chris holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Software Engineering from the Oregon Institute of Technology. Next to him is Anthony Uzul, who you've also heard earlier today. He is the Vice President of Research and Development for Digital Science at Thermo Fisher Scientific. And previously, he was the President and Co-Founder of Core Informatics, which Thermo Fisher acquired in 2017. So prior to that, he was the Associate Director of Research Informatics at CGI Pharmaceuticals. And Anthony holds a Bachelor of Science in Medic Biomedical Engineering from Boston University. So to my right is David Sexton. He is the director of scientific computing at Biogen, where he's responsible for data infrastructure and advanced computing for the company's research and development, early development program. David joined Biogen from the Novartis Institutes for Biomedical Research, where he was responsible for omics information systems. He has 25 years of experience in sequencing informatics and data analysis and has worked in both academia and industry. David holds an undergraduate degree in molecular and cellular biology from the University of Arizona and a master's degree in computer information systems from the University of Phoenix. So next up is uh, Dana Seahale, who is director of IT informatics at Cell Signaling Technology, which she joined in 2017. At the company, she and her team are responsible for implementing and maintaining the core informatics LIMP system and the Atlassian JIRA platform as well as other software systems that are used in product development and production. Prior to her current appointment, she held various IT management positions at Ironwood Pharmaceuticals and at Biogen. Dana holds a Bachelor's of Science in Biochemistry from Evergreen State College. And last but not least, we have Pat Pijanowski, who is Managing Director for Accenture Scientific Informatics Services and responsible for general management and operational oversight of the life sciences portion of the practice. He joined Accenture in 2017 after it acquired LabAnswer, where he was responsible for establishing a pharma and life sciences consulting practice. And before that, he was chief operating officer of LabVantage Solutions. Uh, prior to that, general manager of the LIMS business unit of life technologies, which of course is now part of Fisher, Thermo Fisher Scientific. Pat holds a Bachelor of Science in Chemistry and Biology from Northwest Missouri State University. So we have all witnessed um, the digital transformation of our lives and our workplaces. We all carry these little computers in our pockets these days, uh, but it hasn't always been like that. For example, when I worked in a lab more than 20 years ago, um, almost nothing was digital, so I, very much uh, distinctly remember, for example, reading off a DNA sequence from uh, an X-ray film while somebody else sitting next to me was uh, writing down the sequence letter by letter and then walked over to a computer to type it in and save it in a Word document. 
So things were not very digital uh, back then. But um, that has changed a little bit now. Although I have to say, I visited the Broad Institute sequencing lab this morning, and I was kind of surprised to say that even though they are not completely digital yet, they had these big charts on the wall um, that show workflows day by day, and it's all handwritten and erased and written over, and they told me that they find this a uh, better system for keeping track of their workflows than being completely digital. Uh, Anyway, um, we're here today to talk about how much progress labs have made in becoming digital in the last few years, what challenges they have encountered along the way, and what um, might likely happen in the next few years. So to kick things off, um, I would like to ask each of you to give me your own definition of what is a digitally enabled lab, because definitions are probably going to differ. So. Who would like to start? Eric? Uh, sure. Just to say that team you visited today was not my team. So. <laughs> uh, I, and I have to confess, I cheated. I, I went and Googled it. I, what is digitalization? I had no idea. Um, so I, I did cheat, and Google told me it meant computerization. And in 2018, I have to say, if any lab, including the one at the Broad, isn't at least partially or mostly computerized, um, you wouldn't be in this room, you'd be you know, looking for a different job at this point, in my opinion. So I, I decided to take a more abstract view of the definition here, and I, I think it's a, one that where you embrace technology. So back maybe five, ten years ago, that was computerization, sure. Um, and now in 2018, I think that means embracing what's the current uh, you know, status of, of, of technology, which is cloud computing. Um, certainly it means introducing machine learning into the processes. So on the data science side, that's pretty obvious. But even on the lab side, it means improving processes through, through you know, smart um, improvements. And in 2023 and 2028, that'll mean totally different things. All right. Mm -hmm. Left. Maybe pass it on to Chris. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, I didn't do any research on that one. Um, <laughs> so uh, for us, digitization has been around even in... 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, getting the lab off of paper. Um, I sometimes feel like I'm working with Charlton Heston, uh, prying paper out of their cold, dead hands. Um, <laughs> and as much as my uh, lab professionals tell me they want change, the moment we actually start to introduce real change into their workflow, um, the answer is somewhere between hell and no. So uh, <clears throat> that said, they're also desperate to advance and desperate to improve. And for us, that's meant um, really focusing on integration of systems, uh, integration of devices, and reducing the amount of just plain stupid data entry that people do. Uh, <clears throat> we're making a lot of advances, but we have a long ways to go. So. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think you know from our experience in terms of the the customers that we interact with um, on a daily basis, it's it's really the the challenge of the rate and pace in which science is evolving. And you know historically, systems um, can't adapt to that rate and pace of change without requiring assistance from colleagues in, in lab informatics, colleagues from IT. Um, and increasingly, I think we have opportunities by you know, embracing a platform-centric approach to enable scientists to deal and manage with that change, um, to quickly and easily be able to contextualize novel sets of data in the broader context of the workflow and, and their product development. Um, and again, our, our focus and, and uh, um, approach is to build a platform and an ecosystem that, again, allows customers and partners the opportunity to deal with rate and page of, uh, of scientific evolution. Maybe David? Can there oh. um, I, I would say for Biogen, what you know, data in the lab means right now is that we really are concentrating on capturing data, being able to reuse data, um, being able to capture that metadata, uh, that is going to be following that data all the way through the process and ultimately where you want to get it to is into the hands of the data scientists so that they can really make sense, biological sense of the data that we're collecting. And, you know, we collect data at scale. Um, being able to operate on that means that you need to prep it so that your data scientists aren't spending 80% of their time munching data. So 
really this is about putting the systems in place that allow us to integrate and operate on data. Thank you. And I, I, what I would add to that, we are at, at Cell Signaling Technology are um, embarking upon a similar journey. Uh, and one of the things that we're also trying to do is ensure that data is available across business processes, so automating business processes. Um, but as part of that, we also need to focus on ensuring that um, data does not end up in silos, which I know has been a challenge historically, um, but also that we're addressing uh, the needs of data across organizations, so making sure that our business processes um, are automated across our organizations as well. So uh, as a consulting practitioner I, and not operating a laboratory, at least not having operated in a laboratory for many years, uh, we see we interact with clients and, and we see things that run the, the entire spectrum, right? And I, and I would encourage all of us to think about digitally enabled labs as where it falls on a continuum and not as something that either exists or doesn't exist. Uh, I think to Eric's point that the earlier that virtually all labs are digitally enabled to some extent today. The question is, where are you on that continuum? Where are you going aspirationally? And what do you need to do foundationally and transformationally in order to get there? All right, so a number of different uh, definitions here. So let's get a little self-assessment from those of you who actually run a lab or lab operations. And that is um, how far along is your own lab in becoming digital or however you uh, want to define that. And uh, what have been the challenges? Can you point out maybe some specific examples? And um, what are you hoping to achieve in the next few years? Maybe start with Dana this time. Hmm? Sure. So um, just from a self-assessment perspective, I would say that um, we're if we're doing a scale of one to 10, let's say, then it's, I would say we're about a three. Uh, we've really just started. Um, as I mentioned, we've been uh, working on our automating business practices, but um, our foundation of data collection has, has a way to go, honestly. Um, so uh, we're excited though that uh, there's so many new capabilities being offered by vendors such as Thermo, um, uh, because really the ability to capture data and then uh, make it available across different business practice today is something that we need to focus on. Is there one specific example you might want to point out what has been a challenge? Sure, mm -hmm. so uh, historically, you know, the ability to, to automate um, uh, a liquid handler, for example, um, has been something that's kind of a point solution. It's not really been approached from a platform perspective. Uh, and what, again, what happens is that creates silos in the organization. So one group in particular might be highly automated, but their neighbors next door are not. And so my hope is that um, we take more of a strategic approach and that we think about these things in the long term and we are able to build platforms that work really across all of the different kinds of laboratories. Mm -hmm. Okay, David? Mm -hmm. So if I was thinking at it, from a biogen perspective, I would say probably we're, if we're gonna use the one to 10 scale, that we're probably at about a six, I would say. And the reason for that is we have the capability to capture data in the lab. We have the capability to capture some of our metadata, but in many instances, things do still live in silos. And it's the, the difficulty that we have is in data integration. And Bringing all of that data together, what we produce internally, what we get from the public domain, especially in the genomics and omics space in general, is very, very difficult. And having systems that allow us to integrate and operate over all of that data has been difficult for us. And if you go out and talk, I think, to most major pharmas, this is something that they're struggling with right now, something that they'd like to be able to do because as we get to the, the space like Eric talked about where we're going into more artificial intelligence and machine learning, you have to have that data in a state where you can actually make sense of it. Those aren't magic algorithms that are, are being used there. You actually have to have that data ready for those, those algorithms. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I want to give myself two assessment numbers. For our platform, for the genomics platform that you visited today and the data sciences platform, I'm going to give us an eight despite the sticky notes you saw. And that, you know, using my definition before of moving to cloud processing, for example, we, we have a very lightweight system that does a very rapid QC process for data coming off a DNA sequencer. 
that's on our premises. But as soon as we are ensured that a particular sample has met its yield and there's no contamination, that data is pushed to the public cloud and processed there. We happen to use Google Cloud for, you know, for our processing, but it could be any public cloud. Um, and so at this point, most genome centers aren't that uh, cloud savvy, and I would give myself an eight for that. But to address the challenges, if I talk about the Broad in general, which is a research institute with lots of scientists and you know, principal investigators, biologists, bioinformaticians, two maybe, you know, the cloud is hard. Uh, if you think about it, it's a whole new process. You don't store data on a normal file system. They sit in an object store. Um, and object storage is very different. People aren't used to dealing with it. You can't just uh, look at your files. You have to, to even use them, you have to spin up a virtual machine and localize, download data to the machine. And that is a whole different system and a whole different process. And it's, very, it's a very different mindset and very difficult to get researchers ready and using it. So I think for us, we are on the low end of the scale, certainly in the two, three category. The stuff that we talked about this morning where we're doing, um, you know, high-end, you know, acquisition of, of images, uh, processing those uh, in Amazon, handling, handling a ton of data back and forth with partners, all of that is highly digital and it works really, really well. But that's only a small piece of our business. We are also a research company and have been working, we have, I think, 60, 65 active studies going on right now with various partners around the, around the world. And we've, you know, like many organizations that have come up as a research org organization, our information systems such as they exist have evolved sometimes very slowly. Um, and are certainly not integrated. For us, the watchword is integration. It's connecting all of these systems and reimagining how we can put all this stuff together, getting away from the almost 300 terabytes we have locally of, of slide images from our 10-year history of, of analyzing slides. So that's, you know, that's the future for us is, is taking the, the next frontier, taking our research lab and taking them into, into the cloud. And uh, it's, it's going to be fun. OK. Yeah. Um, so becoming digital as a lab has involved not only organizations internally, but also exchanging data with others, I guess, right? And that often, as I understand, involves cloud computing, making data available, sharing data internally and externally. So I was wondering what your thoughts are on how you strike the right balance between data security, data privacy, and the need to share data with others. I don't know who would like to comment on that. Maybe Eric again? I'll comment about anything. No, just, mm -hmm. uh, Dana mentioned data silos. That was a, it was a good phrase. Uh, so we personally have about 75 petabytes of genomic data under uh, management. And uh, at this point, the days of copying that data into hard drives and shipping it to collaborators is well over at this point. Um, and it's also wasteful to have multiple copies of that data at this point. Um, so we've kind of shifted the paradigm, again, using the cloud computing paradigm. Instead of bringing the data to researchers, or the new way of phrasing it is, hey, let's bring the researchers to the data. Let's build a platform that's cloud-based um, and, and you know, build it up so that researchers can do all the work they need to do there. I mentioned it was difficult, and it is difficult, but if you put enough infrastructure and support in place, it makes it happen. Um, we actually got, uh, um, so the National Can Cancer Institute has funded us to, as part of their cloud pilot system, to build such a platform and a framework. Um, it went, there was a lot of, they made us go through some security protocols. We had to pass FISMA audits. That's the Federal Information, Information Security Management Act, which basically certifies that we have, we can hold government data, we have an authority to operate and redistribute that data. It, it's a big process, a uh, lot of red tape, but you know, we had to prove that we are secure with the right uh, you know, auth authentication, authorization protocols. Um, so yeah, security is difficult. There's, if you actually look at the UI for your Google Cloud buckets, there's a big button on the top right that says, Sh make this data public. It's so easy to press that button and make all of your data public to the world. And again, if you have human test subject data, that's very risky. Um, so there's a, a balance to strike to make sure that button never gets pressed. But on the other hand, there's no other way for us to possibly share our data other than this paradigm. Mm -hmm. 
who else wants to comment on data sharing? So like Chris, for, yeah. for our end of the world, it gets interesting because we're actually required to share patient data with, with some of our partners. So we are, we're required to share data with Genomic Health. They commercialize the test. They interface with physicians. They actually deliver the patient report that our doctor signs back to the ordering physician. And so creating that, that mechanism to securely exchange this required information is absolutely critical. Um, other cancer labs like ours are also required to share data with state cancer registries, with the Centers for Disease Control, um, and not just the diagnoses and the count, but the actual patient information. So uh, it's a real interesting thing. We spend so much time worrying about security, digital security, keeping that patient information private, and then to turn around and be required to share it with people just feels strange. It's, 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 it, it got to get your mind wrapped around it a little bit uh, when you first start it. So. Dana? Mm -hmm. Sure. So um, we actually um, value collaboration with our customers. And so we are um, always looking for actually more ways to share information. So perhaps from a balanced perspective, um, we're at one end of the pendulum swing, let's say. Um, but uh, we're always trying to make sure that uh, our data that we've collected is available to our customers so that in the end, um, they are able to use our products in the best way possible and also benefit from the research that we've done. And do you encounter data privacy and security issues at all? And uh, we, of course, have to comply with um, various privacy laws, absolutely, although it's, it's more on the um, order management, customer management perspective rather than on, the, on a patient perspective. Yeah, so, so sharing data is also critical for us. Um, we're part of the UK Biobank 500K um, whole exome sequencing consortium with quite a few other pharma companies, and we're talking about petabytes of data when you're talking about 500 thousand individuals by their exome. Um, so sharing that data can really only happen in the cloud. Um, we turn to vendors to be able to, to share that data um, and to analyze that data. Um, so we, we're, as a consortium, we've been working with DNA Nexus as a, as a tool to work in the cloud. Um, but you know, obviously there are other vendors who do this. And in terms of security, you know, at this point, a lot of companies don't really under, fully understand how to do security properly. Like when you're dealing with clinical data, yes, it's extremely important to be secure. But on the other end, the data security guys look at that and say, anything that happens, it's my career on the line if something goes wrong. So they tend to lock everything down in a way that it takes, it's very difficult to get back at the data and to share the data. So there's the the constant discussion that you have to have with the, your data security teams to make that work. Okay, related to that, I'm just wondering, uh, some of you might be dealing with research data as well as patient data. If you could just point out some of the differences um, dealing with patient data versus dealing with research data and what is required with one, or not the other. Do you have to? Yeah, I can mm -hmm. start with that. Mm -hmm. So um, obviously we deal with both. Um, dealing with patient data, obviously you're dealing with um, personal health care information, social security numbers, names, addresses. Those are, you know, there are penalties if, if you have a data breach with that data. So that is something that in dealing with that kind of data, you have to limit who can have access to it. You have to um, log who has had access to it and what they've done with that data. So that's something in the research space that you don't necessarily have to do. Um, oftentimes systems get built so that they will do both. Um, but in most cases you'll see research data as more what I call the wild west where anyone can have access to it. But it, as you look inside of pharmas, most people are starting to get to the point where they also want to have that capability to limit who can even see research data uh, and log what they're doing with that data so that it doesn't escape the company. Anyone else? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, interesting. So uh, our research data is still human test subject data, and you know we still have to be very secure. Um, it's no different than the clinical data at all, except for one thing: there's no personally identifiable information with either the clinical research data for us at the Broad. Um, it's just documentation. It's 
the hell of documentation is on the clinical side and the research side is so easy to use. Again, you have to, you still have to worry about security. We can't just let that data get out, but any change at all in the process in the lab or, you know, other than a VM falling over and lifting it back up, anything requires a change control process and documentation and reporting it out on the clinical side and the research side is just easy to use. Very different experience. That's interesting. Yeah. So I actually have a follow-up question on that one. So I uh, spent some time with a lawyer several years ago who was trying to uh, tell me that a whole genome sequence or even a partial sequence was p personal identifiable information. I'm curious where you guys landed on that. Uh, I have to be very careful. Legally, it's not. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. If anyone from the FDA is here, don't listen. No, nothing happened. Uh, you're just going to make my job much more difficult, so please don't raise those questions. I'm here for you, <laughs> Anyone on this side? Yeah, I'll, I'll chime in, even though I'm not, again, I'm, I'm a consulting practitioner, and so I see what, what happens in quite a lot of places with a lot of clients that, that range throughout the spectrum. I, I think it's worth noting, though, just how remarkable it is that we're having this discussion today. It wasn't that long ago that the idea of collaboration and sharing data outside of one's four walls was a completely foreign concept with throughout the life sciences and pharma industry at least, right? And the, the impact that digital technologies and enablement has had on advancing science and advancing the industry, right? And creating the, 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 the genesis behind having a conversation like this. What a great challenge for us to be talking about because the, the, the state of science has been driven exponentially faster by virtue of enabling that collaboration, right? It, it's eminently solvable from a technology standpoint, secondly, I would say, right? And it's really, from my perspective, probably more of a challenge to, to, uh, to capture and embody the human aspects of and the organizational aspects of how do you want to collaborate with whom under what circumstances what regulatory uh, implications are there with the model that you're employing right and and you know what implications are there in this part of the world versus that part of the world but but engaging with your organization to understand what you're trying to accomplish right and what are the implications of that from a regulatory and an operational standpoint the, the technology becomes, I don't want to say it's trivial, right? It's because it's not. This, this stuff is hard to do, but it's certainly not the hardest part of the equation. It's getting an organization aligned on that. Yes, yeah. yeah, so uh, becoming more digital has certainly allowed certain things to happen, like collaboration and exchanging data. But I was just wondering to, if we could talk a little bit more about what becoming digital enables you to do. Could each of you who run a lab point out one thing that has be being more digital allowed you to do that you were not able to do before that? Maybe Dana wants to start? Sure, so um, I actually have a talk tomorrow um, where I'll show something that we've been able to do that we were not able to do before, and that's really uh, visualizing information because for the first time ever we have um, the entire uh, data model for product development in a single location, and we are now able to build dashboards on top of that. Um, so that's something that we're really excited about. Um. I guess from my perspective, I would say we, we had a project um, where we were looking at, we had a large set of, of clinical um, samples that we were looking at as about 2,000 individuals, um, we were able to combine that with data that was coming from a large consortium, TCGA, um, and really operate across all of that data, integrate and operate across all of it. And the reason we were able to do that is that we were able to use the metadata and, and integrate that with our, internally, um, uh, with our internal metadata as well so that people could actually query across all of that data and divide, subdivide the data set how they want it to do, to do their analysis. Okay. Uh, so the way it works for us is when a genome gets sequenced, uh, before it gets processed, we need to fingerprint it with a, a genotyping chip with an array. And there was a time about a year and a half ago where we got a bad batch of chips 
and none of the fingerprinting could happen. So we had a big backlog of genomes that needed to get processed. If you if that had happened four years ago, we that back and we were trying to process all that data in our you know uh, in our data center on premises. It would have taken weeks to months to actually get it all uh, out of that backlog. It would have, which would have cost us millions of dollars. You know, a year and a half ago, we just pushed that data up to the cloud, called Google, asked them to up our quota. So the cloud is not actually infinite, but it could be. It could be sometimes, um, and got all through in, in a matter of a week. And you can actually see the spike of our usage, and it was beautiful. Um, you know, that's that's it's the right paradigm. And it's, you know, without that, we would never have made it. We actually did something like that recently. We referred to it internally as uh, turning the system up to 11. <laughs> so, uh, Spinal Tap reference for the old people in the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> so for us, digitization is no less dramatic than we could not offer the testing that we're offering today. So the ARV7 test for men with late stage prostate cancer would not be on the market today were we not integrating with partners, were we not integrating with different platforms, had we not built this ecosystem of systems all connected together, you know, anchored by digital imaging algorithms and all that stuff. So we literally would not exist, uh, it, or the test would not exist and be available on the market today. So for us, it's been a game changer for the company, uh, and it's really taken us, allowing us to go to that next step and evolve uh, pretty dramatically in the next couple of years. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great, yeah, so looking into the future a little bit, uh, what trends in data, data digitalization are you keeping an eye on and what do you think is interesting? What do you think will change over the next five years or so? Uh, the easiest answer there is costs are gonna come down, capabilities are gonna go up. So if you've watched Amazon at all in the last couple of years, um, the the cost of storage, which is something that we all pay a lot of money for, um, has continued to go down. The evolution of services like Glacier has continued to come down, and that allows little guys like us to to play in a in a very big pool. And while the cloud may not be infinite, for companies like us, may as well be. <laughs> so. So how much do you think the cost will continue to come down? I think in the last two years, Glacier has gone from, was it nine, cent, nine, ten cents per gigabyte per month to I think seven, six or seven cents. So I would anticipate that in the next couple of years, we'll see, continue to see halving of costs. You know, so it's kind of the inverse of Moore's law for, for computational power. I think we're gonna see the inverse of that for uh, cloud costs. Now at some point we've got to bottom out because the te technologies do not will not continue to evolve infinitely. Um, and somewhere in the world, there's gonna to have to be a, a, a place to store those individual bits. Um, but yeah, I'm a, it, it, to me, it's, it's it, you know, I think we just have to look at the curve. I think we're just, it'll, it'll, at some point it should bottom out, but um, I think we're a ways away from that, a couple of years probably. Okay. okay, so cost of storage is one trend you're looking at. Any other trends in computing that's enabled by all this, for example. I, I liked your answer. Thanks. It was good. Uh, <laughs> I, I mentioned machine learning before, uh, and even on the lab side, we're just starting to look at processes now, how to get the computer nerds in there to, to help drive down costs. And they've, they've done it at this point for sequencing. The weirdest thing is, you know, even how we batch samples and how we multiplex them across sequencing lanes. They, they've managed to find a process through, you know, through their machine learning approaches to actually make it cheaper. They've cut, not cost, cost in half, but whatever it is, millions of dollars of savings that way. Um, any ways we can get that in there and, and you know, use the, the latest techniques to, to make things better and faster and cheaper, that's what we want to do. Mm -hmm. um, I would say that I'm watching a, a couple of things. One is um, most people are operating on a single cloud right now. I think in the future people will operate agnostically across multiple clouds. I think that's a place that, that the world is going at the moment. You'll actually, you know, it could, it could be on demand. You go to the cheapest cloud uh, for your work at that time. Uh, another thing that I'm looking at are um, data analysis platforms. So this is actually making what we call our data fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. And then having a platform where a data analyst can come in, do a short query, 
pull back all of their data, and then analyze it all on the same platform. So the, those sorts of systems are starting to come along. That's one place that I think is, a, it's, I guess you could call it a killer app, that if that was there right now, certainly a lot of pharmas would jump on it. Uh, one of the things that we're excited about is really the ability to combine um, our internal data sets with uh, external data sets, and particularly publicly available information, mm -hmm. so that it can help our research scientists understand what research is happening uh, out uh, at pharmaceutical companies, also at universities, um, so that it can help them de de develop better products or, or understand how research areas are changing. And so, of course, we are looking to the promise of cloud computing to help us build tools similar to what, um, what you mentioned, because we also have a need to have uh, apps that are combining these different data sets and giving researchers a different way to analyze that information. And I would say that um, researchers are looking for ways to do that that is really personalized. So it's not something that we might be able to predict for them in advance, but giving them the tools so that they can do their different queries or different kinds of analyses much more quickly and really um, as, the, as their needs are changing, independent of what's happening perhaps in IT or in other parts of the organization. Okay, great, thank you. So let's talk about the ideal lab now. So if you had to redesign your lab from scratch, uh, how would you what would you do differently this time? How would you design the informatics infrastructure? Well, having just done that. Uh, ah, mm -hmm. <laughs> You're going first again. Yeah, it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> having just done that, it's, it's, you start with no paper. You start with, um, you know, for us, it, it even starts before the sample even shows up on our door. We know about every kit we've ever deployed. We know exactly where it's been shipped to. And we know exactly when FedEx picks it up to bring it back to us. And by starting at the beginning of that sample and how it comes to us, and, and sometimes even before it comes to us, um, it's, it's been fantastic. And the visibility, it, it seems so trivial that you, that you have a good idea of the number of samples that are showing up the next day. But it's, it's just those simple kinds of things have, have really uh, improved our ability to, to manage our workflow. Um, you know, we... We've moved away from, we actually hit, there are parts of our business where people are still driving calculators to get their work done. And it's the same damned math every single time. Um, we, didn't, we didn't do that the second time, right? We, 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 we fixed that. So um, you, you just start at the beginning of the process and work the problem all the way through to the end. Okay. Dana, what would you do differently if you had to redesign your lab? Um, I guess I, when I think about it, um, it's the same that if you were building a house. Um, you know, you, at home you have uh, all of your devices connected and you all expect it just to work seamlessly. And um, that, that's not been our experience in the lab, unfortunately. Uh, and in, in particular, you know, we have um, older instruments that uh, maybe don't get as much care and attention as some of the newer ones. Uh, and so one of the things that I would recommend is, um, of course, making sure that you have a way to keep all of the things current uh, without um, introducing a lot of disruption when things are taken away. Okay. David, do you want to continue? So I, I think the first thing I'd want to do is scrap everything that's not integrated, that everything that creates silos, I would want to get rid of. And I would really want to have a platform where we could you know, move from as a as a scientific sample or a sci scientific asset comes in the door, we know everything about it. The way that I sort of the analogy I put out there is Amazon would never allow anything into their warehouse that they didn't know every single thing about. So those are this is where we need to get to because when you think about those scientific assets, that that is the metadata that people use in their analyses. So if, if that lives in a spreadsheet, that's the other thing I would do is I'd kill Excel, by the way. Excel should die in science. <laughs> um, so most of that data ends up in a spreadsheet locked in you know, somebody's computer and never to be seen again. Um, so what I would really like to do is get systems that make it hopefully somewhat easy for people to, to input the data that's needed by the, the teams further downstream. Um, and then, you know, get to the point where we can do data analysis and then give people visualizations that make sense to them. 
I think something that a lot of people don't realize is that bench scientists are not the ones who are typically analyzing data that's at genome scale. It is, it's actual data scientists that are sitting down with that data, and then they're providing visualizations back to the bench scientists. So the world, that paradigm is changing a little bit of, I'm a bench scientist, I do all my work, and then I do my own analysis. That's not the real world anymore. Institute. All right. uh, <laughs> we, when we built our own limb system, we made a lot of assumptions, namely, as an example, you know, that we'd always be on premises in our data center, and they almost all broke when we moved to the cloud. Uh, I don't know how we would have done it differently, but you know, it, just being aware of the future technologies, even if you aren't um, at the moment using them, um, just to, you know, not not make any of those assumptions. Assume. Assume that anything is possible, and I guess I can ask Chris whether that's even possible since you've built it, but as much as possible, go in with no assumptions as to the future. Is it even possible? Yeah, and I would also assume cloud first before on-prem. That's one thing that I, I was just thinking as the rest of you guys were talking. It's like, you know, you, 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 should, you shouldn't be justifying why you're putting something in the cloud. You should be justifying why you're not putting it in the cloud. Why are you willing to take on all of that additional risk in-house? Why are you willing to take on all of that additional maintenance and support and personnel and all the stuff you have to do to keep it on-prem? Justify that before you make that decision because it becomes a much easier conversation around putting it in somebody else's data center, which is really all the cloud is, right? You're, you're renting somebody else's data center, renting somebody else's security practices, all of their physical security, all of the device and OS upgrades, all of that stuff, you don't have to deal with anymore. And I, I, so for, for us, it's, it's you know, the, the one assumption I would make would be cloud first, justify on-prem. Great point. Yeah, mm -hmm. Great. yeah let's uh, spend a couple of minutes about future-proofing your system. So how are you future-proofing your IT systems and making sure that the data that's in your archives can still be used many years from now? What is your strategy for that? If you have any. <laughs> Dana? Mm -hmm. I, I, right now, not very much. Not enough, I guess, is the best way to, to put it. So if we go back and look at the data that we've produced right now, it would take some very heavy lifting and curation to actually make use of something that was produced three to five years ago because it's probably in a database that's been shut down. Somebody has, you know, maybe they've migrated it to a new database. Maybe they've only partially migrated it. So really when you're building these systems, you need to have the proper documentation so that somebody can go back and make sense of, of the data that's in that system and has a method to migrate it. Um, I think this is one of the most difficult things when you're building a system because you're spending all your time on, and money on making sure that what you're producing works for everyone right now. You're not really thinking about five or 10 years down the road. I have a bad answer. Uh, I, I think, so what the Broad does is every 18 to 24 months is it reprocesses all of its data. Uh, from scratch, which, yeah, it looks great, except it costs a lot of money and it's a big pain in the behind. Um, I, I don't know that there's a better answer for us, but it's what we do. Um, if anyone has a better answer, um, I'm ready. Dave, I'll just echo what you've said. Um, we have also spent quite a considerable amount of time ensuring that we migrate data from legacy systems into the platform for science, and it was, of course, the right decision to make. Uh, but it doesn't change the fact that we still have legacy databases that we need to take care of and ensure that they're maintained, and, and at some point, we'll need to address them. Yeah, I think one of the challenges for ensuring the long-term integrity and, and utility of your data is adherence to open standards. Um, you know, within the pharmaceutical industry, we're seeing a big shift and a big adoption in the allotrope foundation and the allotrope data format, and I think that's one example. But that's just really um, uh, data format standards, right? There's connectivity standards, I think, that we need to be adhered to as well. And back to your prior question, but maybe with a slightly different spin, you know, if, if you were to think about how the approach you would take when building a lab from scratch, well, as a, as a provider of tools, 
when we were thinking about you know, how we would build the platform for science from scratch, when we add new and novel capabilities to it, we're always looking for opportunities to add in elements that you know, come from open standards and you know, some of the new innovations that we're making from our workflow engine. Again, rather than building our own workflow engine from scratch, we went to an open standard of the BPMN uh, format and methodology. And so I think as uh, practitioners of, of lab information management, anytime we have the opportunity to adopt and embrace standards, either as purveyors of that technologies or consumers of that technology, it's incumbent upon us to do it to, uh, to ensure the long-term integrity and, and viability of that information. I'll actually echo that a little bit on the on you know our, the core of our business is uh, uh, high resolution images of slides, and file format image file formats change all the time right there's a there's a constant evolution but we've we've actively moved towards open standards for our our image storage um, and maintaining libraries to convert those source images into something we know about. And while we may not know the eventual destination of all of our images, we may not know exactly what they're, you guys are reprocessing everything every couple of years, we, you know, we, we don't know what that's gonna look like, but by maintaining those libraries, we're at least ensuring access to, to our historic data. Um, and we do a lot of hoping too. That's our other technique. <laughs> Because you can only plan for what you know about, right? Where there's only so much you can future-proof yourself, and you can design yourself into the perfect architecture that will cause you to never have to worry about this. And it'll take you 20 years to get there, and by then everything will have moved on, and you'll be looking for a job. So the practical realities of developing systems like this is you just can't future-proof yourself completely but you can adopt open standards. You can make your systems open and available to other parts of your environment um, and at least give yourself a fighting chance to be able to get to your data, get to your metadata uh, at some point in the future and just be ready to do a lot of work when that future comes around. All right, thanks. To Oh yeah, please, yeah, go I, ahead. I, mm -hmm. I think I'd, I'd like to share you know, recurring themes from multiple clients across multiple industries, quite frankly, whether it be in the context of what would you do differently if you started from scratch or what would you think about or how would you suggest uh, preserving the, the viability of your data across multiple generations of software platforms across the course of time, right? I th I th there's lots of things that one could do, but I, I would have to say that one of the recurring themes I hear over and over again is I wish I had uh, I wish I had built and acted upon a cohesive data strategy from the beginning. I wish we had thought about that from the very beginning, right? Whether it be adherence to standards or building out a thoughtful data governance structure, right? Or basic stuff like common vocabulary, taxonomy, and ontologies right from the scratch, right? Right from the start, right? All of those things, the luxury of someone starting up something from scratch today is one has the ability to take advantage of t new technology and the opportunity to learn from others in that regard, right? And so a cohesive data strategy, I think, makes goodness spread throughout lots of dimensions of what we do and what we struggle with year in and year out. Yeah, sounds like very good advice. And that leads me to my last question. That is, I was hoping you could each provide like one single piece of advice you would like to give to anyone in the audience here who, who runs a lab, whether it's a newly built lab or an established lab, just one thing you would like to give them on the way. You want to start with that? I just gave it. <laughs> you, don't, you Basically, you just gave it. That's right. Yeah. That's probably yeah. it, actually. Exactly. Yeah. Start with mm -hmm. the data in mind, right? Follow processes and follow the data, right? Before you even think about applying systems overlay. Right? It's not a systems problem, right? It's a people problem, or, or not a problem, it's a challenge, right? Mm -hmm. It's understanding what you do for, a, for a, a living, right? How your business operates or how you want it to operate, right? And getting agreement on that and then embodying that with technology. And I'll just add on to that. Um, in addition, I, I would, if I were starting over, I should say, or 
even on barking at something new, I would I'd take more time focused on sort of what I'd call business change management. So how is the, what we're implementing or how is the business changing and, and how is that gonna impact people both in their everyday jobs but also organizationally? Uh, how are they going to work differently together? And uh, hopefully, how is the technology going to help them do that? I guess two pieces of advice. One is don't be afraid to talk to your peers uh, at other companies or at other institutions about what they're doing. Oftentimes they will have solved this problem for you already or have come close to doing that. Um, and then probably the, uh, I lost my thought there for the second one, but there is, you know, when, when I've had a major problem, I know what it was. So the other one is make sure that you're, uh, your institution is on board with what you're doing. So oftentimes things will, um, you'll get halfway through a project and someone will want to end it because they haven't seen results yet. So you need to make sure that everyone is on board and understands where you're going with your project. Uh, I'm actually gonna repeat a thought that Chris gave and I'm before you now so I can do that, um, which is if you, know, you have world-class people doing something, utilize it. So. Cloud security, if you have you know, one of the Amazon or Google in their clouds, use them as much as you can. Don't try to build things that other people are already, are already doing at world-class scale. Word. <laughs> so I'm gonna go super tactical and I'm gonna repeat a bullet point from my early presentation and that is test your backups, test that they're getting done and do restores for the love of God Every year, make sure you're doing this for every one of your cloud providers. Um, the, 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 the consequences of failure there are huge. Um, yeah, have test you your a, backups. Have you had a failure? So I haven't had a failure of cloud backups, but I did at a lab, we had a failure of um, tape backup. Remember, remember tapes? Um, and we were, I had a lab that was down for about 22 hours and during that 22 hour outage, we weren't entirely sure where the backup was that we needed to restore that system. Eventually we were able to get it back online without the backup. Um, and it was, it was a pain in the hell that I don't want anybody to ever have to, to live through personally. So um, 22 hours doesn't seem like a long time but when, you're, when you've got extraordinarily sick individuals on the other side of a, of a sample who are desperate for information, it makes all the t difference in the world, so. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll reiterate a lot of what Pat and, and Dana and, and David said. I mean, each of those really resonated with me as, as key um, themes of, of challenges that we typically experience when doing an implementation with a customer, it's, and it all is around business readiness. Right, you know, uh, making sure that all of the workflows in your laboratory are well documented and well understood by all of the stakeholders before beginning an implementation. Establishing and identifying the, the taxonomy and ontology for tra you know, tracking and managing the data within your organization and making sure that you know, all participants within the organization are, are, well, what, excuse me, are well represented in that process, whether it's lab scientists, lab managers, executives, or even increasingly collaborators. And, uh, and when selecting a vendor solution, again, look towards those vendors that are openly embracing standards, whether it's uh, adherence to data formats and data standards like the allotrope specification or particularly around connectivity standards. Um, you know, to avoid data silos, you need to make sure that your data is interoperable and transferable from one environment to another. So that's something that's increasingly gonna be important as, uh, as to Chris's point, more and more businesses are adopting the cloud. Okay, so with that, let's open up uh, questions from you in the audience. Uh, we have two microphones in these two aisles. And if you have a question, just raise your hand and somebody will bring you the microphone. There's one in the back there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Hi, I work in a, a big pharma and, and I, you know, listening to you, you're hitting on a, a, a sore point for me, which is, you know, the integration of data across modalities, platforms, systems, whatever you want to call it, departments. It's maybe the most frustrating thing that I have to deal with in large pharma. And, and so, you know, thinking about the history of solving this problem, you know, um, you talk about data standards and all that's great, but you have a lot of legacy data that you need to get to regardless, it doesn't have good standards. So 
people have tried to solve this problem. Years and years, decades of trying to solve this problem. 10 years ago, if I was to ask you what was the best way to do that, you'd probably say go build a data warehouse, right, or a lake. Five years ago, it was big data, right, and get a Hadoop cluster, right, and pull it all together. So, you know, uh, the, the alternative is, you know, the federated approach, right, where, where what, what I think uh, Anthony just said, which is have good silos that you can access. And so I think it's really touching on, David, you sort of, I think, uh, uh, sort of touched on analysis platforms, maybe the next big app, right? And, and it's, it's a great idea and it's easy to talk about, but, but I guess the question for all you is, how do you do it, right? What is today's and what is the future way of doing this? And, and you know, that's a, in, in a pharma, that's a microcosm of a bigger world problem, right? Because you have all these little silos in a, in a pharma. Expand that up a helicopter view across the world. You're integrating even more complicated things. So I'm going to keep it simple for you. <laughs> you're a consultant. You walk into pharma and you have to solve this problem. How do you do that today? I'll take that since I've been at a big pharma too. Um, I would I would say first of all, you're crazy if you think you're going to do that all at once. It's not going to happen. This is going to be a progression over years to actually integrate all of that data. Um, you're gonna, it's, you're gonna be spending time building new systems, you're gonna be spending time curating old data, you're gonna be spending time getting old systems into, um, into a state where you actually can use them properly. Uh, so I would, the first thing I would say is this is a marathon, it's not gonna happen quickly. The second thing I would say is you need to have a data strategy and you need to have a data architecture. If you don't have those two things, data is never going to be interoperable. Um, and that also goes to having a proper ontology about the metadata that you're working with as well. So there is no magic wand. I've, I've been in this long enough. Any, any you know, vendor who's come to me and said, I have the solution, they can leave. <laughs> because I, I don't believe that. There's, there's no single solution. And it's going to be attacking these things one by one. And with in mind that these, that at the end of the day, everything has to integrate. No, I, what is a data lake? <laughs> it's a it's a data swamp, <laughs> right? So there's there's I mean, yeah, no, no, I would not build a data lake. A data catalog, yes, but not a data lake. Okay. Yeah, Anyone think, else? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I think yeah, uh, you know, David, your your response to that question certainly resonated with me. I don't think there is a single solution out in the industry that's going to you know address. Uh, particularly large pharma's challenges. Um, you know, that's, that's why we take an open ecosystem approach and actively invite partners to participate. Um, it, and again, to your point as well, it, it is a marathon, not a sprint. I mean, in terms of where to get it started, I think there's, you know, obviously business drivers, whether it's a new lab and a greenfield opportunity that you're looking to spin up or, you know, a lab that's experiencing critical pain points with an existing system. I mean, for the large pharma that we've worked with, you know, they'll start at, you know, a particular point of new product development, whether it's in research or development or somewhere in between. And, um, you know, they'll, they'll take a strategy to, um, um, set down a, a, an old legacy system, whether it's a vendor, a legacy vendor system or a legacy homegrown system. And when there isn't data standards in place, the data standard is the legacy data model for those products. And, you know, uh, vendor solutions that give you the opportunity to configure that, that standard within your organization is, is something that we found to be important. Um, and you just iteratively build on it and evolve from it. But before you can even set, set down some of these legacy vendor solutions, you have to be able to integrate with them first. And so interoperability is, is key. And I think in, investing in, in tools and technologies that have very strong APIs is, is important when you're thinking about that consolidation strategy because you, you can't just immediately put a system down. You're going to have to leave at least parts of it in place to integrate with it for a period of time. Okay. Anyone else interested? In, okay. Uh, sure, being consultant, I guess I'll answer that question from my perspective. <laughs> it, uh, um, I, I, I guess I come at it a num an, uh, answering this in a number of different ways. First, I'd, I'd say it's a big problem. It's a big problem that's not going to go away. Ten years from now, we'll be sitting around talking about things that we wished we had thought of or had technology to deal with today, right? And so I, I, I think... Uh, and I don't mean that in a fatalistic manner. I mean that in an acknowledgement of we're always, we're here doing what we do because these problems exist and they'll continue to exist. And this is an ongoing process for us. Secondly, I'd echo what Anthony said is that you'll, we're going to solve that problem in context. 
how we solve it in one place and one set of circumstances is going to be different than someplace else, not the least of which is affected by the organization's appetite for solving it, right? Uh, and thirdly, I'd say like any big problem, um, you know, it, you solve it like how do you eat an elephant? You eat it one bite at a time, right? So break it up into pieces and get started today, right? I, I think that those are sort of not, those are sort of the guiding principles that I would adhere to. Okay, thank you, Pat. Any other questions? Hi, yeah. my, my name is Chetan. I'm from Big Pharma too. I do have another question related to the privacy that we talked about, um, data privacy basically. Um, why are we not looking at better encryption models in terms of being data privacy? So we talked about sharing data. Yes, that's the future maybe, but then we also talk about the negative effect of it in terms of sending all this private data outside if there is anything going on. So why are we not uh, more involved in terms of encrypting it wherever it is required and then because of the latest updates in EU area in terms of data privacy, it, it is coming. Whether we want to do it or not now, it's going to come to US and across the globe. So are, is there any strategies that you are aware of in terms of how you share the data but make it private or encrypt as much as you can in it and still make it usable data. and shareable, collaborable? So my first problem with encryption, I'll give you two next, is that it requires a key to get back in, yep. right? And so no encryption system is, is as good as the system by which you store your encryption keys. Uh, and, and that's an inherently flawed because there's humans involved to some degree or another, right? And so 128-bit encryption through brute force would take, I think I read something recently, a billion years to to crack and 256 would take a billion billion years. I, I personally, I think the first billion is probably good enough. Um, so, you know, for my end of the world, I haven't been looking into encryption beyond the 128 bit standards that we've got in place today, um, but maybe that's short sighted too. Yeah. Uh, so we are ad addressing an interesting problem where we have data we want to want to compute against and another foreign country has the same thing. We're happy to do a joint project, but we don't actually want to send our American samples to them, and they don't want to send their Finnish or Chinese samples to us. So one thing we're exploring totally in a research setting is uh, secure multi-party compute. And this is the millionaire's problem. We have two millionaires who want to see who has more money, but don't want to actually show their checkbooks. Um, so it's a, it's a whole paradigm where you can have a, you know, a third party that's trusted. It doesn't actually have to be an individual. Um, send the, the data there to be computed on and the results are returned back, but no, no uh, contributing party actually gets to see the, the other party's data. Um, so we are thinking about those types of paradigms. It's complex, the math is hard, it's slow, it's expensive, um, but there are definitely companies and research papers coming out now exploring that, that field. Um, well, I'll, I'll say, Blockchain. Uh, I just wanted to say that because it's stupid. <laughs> um, no, so so obviously in the cloud we make sure that our data is encrypted at rest and in transit. Um, and again, as you, as has been said, um, you do have to worry about the keys, obviously. Um, and a lot of this is around governance and making sure that pop people are using the data properly. Um, there has to be, uh, you know systems in place to make sure that they are using that data correctly, but at the end of the day, it's a human endeavor. I mean, you, you will not be able to stop any sort of hacking. You know, somebody's gonna be able to get through the system at the end of the day. So you do your best um, and you know, encrypt everything along the line, but there's, there's no way to prevent everyone from getting into that, anyone from getting into that system, excuse me. Uh, ask right. a follow-up question on that, though. Something yeah, different. Th anybody else have a question? Uh, no? Yeah, then go ahead with your follow-up okay. question. Mm -hmm. In terms of data sharing, so again, bringing back to the pharma point, like we already know that only 1% of the products that are 
successful, and 90, 99% is failure in terms of pharma companies. Um, is there any plan to look at that data and explore that data and maybe make some use of it across like a consortium where we can actually, okay, this company said it's failed for us. Maybe there is a data that you could use and maybe use it for some other modeling in future um, in terms of solving all the problems that humans have in terms of drugs. Is there anything like that that you guys are aware of? Could you just repeat the question, please? So sharing data that is deemed as not usable or not uh, successful. So I, I did my clinical studies and it failed. So can we reuse that for some other, so you, you use that lesson learned for something that is different for the next stage or for, maybe I, I, I have a failure in stage two, but maybe I could utilize it for some other similar product for stage three between companies. So data sharing is the next big thing if we are talking about and why not we utilize across companies in terms of that data sharing. So I haven't seen anything across companies as a consortium, but internally we do reuse that data. So the clinical data is often combined with our research study data um, for as a hypothesis generation tool. Yeah. Um, so I do see that being used internally. Pharma companies are pretty wary of sharing failed study data <laughs> with other companies, especially. Um, so that's sort of the crown jewel. So I haven't seen anything where people have wanted to do that as part of the whole industry. But, but internally, you see a lot of, of efforts to find usages for data that's, you know, from prior experiments, from prior whatever, right? Because you just know, don't know what's in there. We've, we've got, as far as I know, 99% of the slides we've ever scanned, we've still got all of those images and we have data about every single one of those white blood cells that we found. So imagine, you know, 100,000 slides, three to five billion white blood cells per slide, um, you've got an interesting data, size, a data set to, to play with. Um, and we're absolutely playing with it. Um, we're just not sure what we're gonna find yet. So between companies, not so much, but internally for our own R&D activities, absolutely. I guess I would just add that um, part of what we are doing is trying to share as, as much information as we can with our customers. And so of course we uh, have an e-commerce platform that facilitates that, but um, so we do try to make available information that, so our, our customers know how to use our products um, and we combine that with external data sources such as citation data to hopefully make that experience more rich for our customers. All right. I think this is all the time we have. Thank you very much to all of you for staying for our panel discussion, staying for, to the end, and let's uh, give a round of applause to our panelists. Thank you. Mm -hmm.